My name is Julie Rybluski. Um, I'm the archivist for Archives and Manuscripts, which is kind of a fancy way of saying that I take care of the paperish materials and audio recordings here. And I'm here in the Research Center of the Chicago History Museum. I'm Ellen Keith. I'm the Director of Research and Access here in the Research Center, which serves the materials that Julie acquires. We have a number of city government documents in the collection and we'll talk about them in terms of our published material and our archival material. For the published material, we have a lot of annual reports of various Chicago offices, the fire department, the police department, etc. Um, we have um, building permits, we have uh, city council proceedings. Um, we have a number of city council proceedings but not all the dates and so one of the things that people can do is we've got a very extensive uh, catalog record for the city council proceeding which indicates what dates we have and where you might find other city council proceedings. Our collection includes a variety of government documents and records related to the city government. Uh, these materials break down into a few distinct categories. Um, one, we have uh, a lot of mayoral papers. So these aren't necessarily the official documents from the mayoral office, but these would be the personal papers, perhaps collected or created by the mayors and their families themselves. Um, we have a tremendous number of aldermanic papers, individual aldermen and alder, alder people uh, who've donated their personal papers. And then also personal collections from different government officials, either elected or appointed, who would have served on different committees or boards or other governmental or quasi-governmental organizations. And then finally, we have a bunch of records related to different city events, things like the 1992 World's Fair planning um, or the uh, fire inquest um, for the city of Chicago. So there are a lot of organizations like that that are city government related that we also hold the records of. We have a very robust online catalog, which we've named Archie. Okay. And what I do when I'm looking for various annual reports by the city, it's you can do um, an advanced search of a title keyword, annual report, okay. um, an author keyword of city of Chicago, <laughs> and then just a general keyword of whatever city department you're looking for. And that's going to get you a record that has, um, you know, do we have it? What years do we have? Um, that kind of thing. So it's you can sort of just sort of brainstorm off the top of your head okay. and determine what we have um, by searching our catalog. Okay. In terms of finding uh, papers that have to do with different city government offices mm -hmm. or different aldermen, um, once again the, the catalog and, and thinking a little bit about your search terms ahead of time will be the easiest way for you to find a good robust list of that uh -huh. um, and actually maybe even sometimes a few things that you didn't expect. Um, one of the easiest ways to do it would be to do a keyword search across all fields for aldermen okay. or perhaps the department or office or program that you're interested in and what it will do is turn up a list of all of the collections that we have of our archival or, or unpublished materials that would have to do with that. In addition to getting the specific papers of individual aldermen, you'll also get sort of that thrill of discovery of finding a few things that maybe aren't papers that were personally generated by the aldermen, but there's often other groups or organizations around the city that they may have been involved with that will also sort of inform on, on their activities and provide other evidence or information about things that they've worked on that are related to city concerns, even though they might not be precisely city government documents in and of themselves. So I actually find that to be a pretty useful way both to find as many records related to that particular office or person, plus a little, a little bonus uh, on the side. In terms of collecting the city government materials for the published materials, I would have to look at my catalog record for the city council proceedings just to see if there is a provenance list, um, which there is not, <laughs> which, which sometimes happens with the published materials. They're not, uh, because they're not necessarily unique. Um, uh, they don't come with a, you know, a, a donor name attached to them the way that the material that Julie receives does with a whole accession number and things like that. So published materials, I mean, the Chicago Historical Society was founded in 1856 and it started as a library with the published materials. So there's just a lot of, we've, there, we've just amassed a lot of these over the years um, without maybe for the published materials, a lot of record keeping about where they came from. We have been asked whether we are the archives for the city of Chicago and we're not. Uh -huh. So we're a private institution um, 
and we and one of the, one of the things that we say we do a lot of um, orientations for college students, high school students, etc. And one of the things that we say is we are not a comprehensive record of the city of Chicago. Um, we depend on what people have chosen to give to us. So. Um, you know, that's why, that's why we like to know what our other insti fellow institutions have, so we can direct people where to fill in, where we don't. But we're not, a, we're not a comprehensive holdings of the city of Chicago. In terms of how we get the materials into our collection and what kind of provenance is associated with them, most of the archival collections and unpublished materials do have, do come to us by way of donation. Um, either from the individual who created them or sometimes you know, a, a family member or a friend or relative or a member of the organization that's still around. Um, it, we tend to get things into our collection once they've stopped being used in their sort of normal original life cycle. Um, that's often connected with different kinds of life transitions like organizations moving offices or people cleaning out um, you know, spaces in their homes. So we definitely, that, that, that is something where there is sort of a donation process involved. And because of that, we do tend to have more of a, a record of the provenance of those who came to it because we do have to make sure that the person giving it to us has the right to give it to us and also how they came by it and what its connection was to, to them and to other people, sort of part of the story of those materials and part of the story of Chicago. Um, as Ellen was mentioning, we don't, we don't seek to be the, the comprehensive record of everything related to Chicago, but we try to have a good strategic representation of things that tell important stories, stories that are otherwise not documented in other places, or stories that represent some, some larger aspect of Chicago that we want to make sure we are, we are covering in the institution. So our goal you know, would maybe be, in that case, not to have every alderman's papers, but key aldermen who represent different districts at different points in time that are, are, are significant for the city. We just recently accessioned a very small collection of papers um, from a gentleman named the last name of Burris, not Roland Burris, a different Burris, but this gentleman was um, the first African American uh, uh, city comptroller. Um, and uh, he passed away somewhat recently. And as things go, um, his, his wife survived him and is, was looking through his materials and, and working with some of her friends, one of whom was also a collection donor, um, he encouraged her to, to work with us to see some of those materials um, get donated, um, either to us or if it wasn't, we weren't the right place, to another facility in Chicago. And so although it wasn't a, a huge collection in terms of, of physical size, there's some really great depth to the, the small amount in terms of what his life was like. Um, both in terms of work um, in, in the area of finance and in the area of city government um, during times when uh, being an African American in Chicago you weren't necessarily heavily represented in those mm -hmm. fields um, but also what um, life growing up on the south side and living on the south side of Chicago is like and so it's a it's a very rich collection despite being a small collection and we find that that's often how things do come to us part of it is sort of our relationships in the community and and us developing sort of a sense of what might be out there and who might have some things that will help us tell and share the stories about Chicago. In terms of, in terms of the collecting life of the Chicago Historical Society, now the Chicago History Museum, um, we've definitely seen some changes in the way that the collection has moved. You know, it started in 1856 as, you know, these white men in Chicago, and, and there was a big acquisition in the 20s um, from the estate of Charles Gunther, um, which gave us a lot of historical Civil War papers, other papers, things like that, um, that sort of took us through. And then um, the museum's longtime uh, curator of archives and manuscripts is Archie Motley, and Archie, our catalog, is named after him. And he is the son of the painter Archibald J. Motley, who has had a revival recently. He had a show at the Cultural Center. He's deceased, but. He was featured at the Cultural Center last year. Um, and Archie Motley, um, uh, his father was African American, his mother was German and white, and he considered himself um, African American even though he looks, looked Caucasian. And he was very interested in the social services papers and social justice, and so he really, in the 60s and 70s, he made a concerted effort to go out to these organizations, the Catholic Interracial Council, Friendship House, and all these other paper um, organizations and really get really sort of change the direction of the collecting. So not 
you know, so much the dead white men, but the, the you know, activist organizations who are working for social justice. And I'm, I'm sorry, I hijacked that from Julie, but that's, no, that's it's, it's something we say when we give our orientations to our students here in the Research Center. I was thinking about that because that's, that's what always occurs to me mm -hmm. when I think about what we're collecting now versus what you would see um, in terms of collections that we used to, to bring in, um, where maybe in th terms of thinking about positions of power, where early, very early collections tend to reflect people who held very traditional and conventional powerful mm -hmm. positions, elected officials, yeah. uh, people you know, at the heads of companies, things like that. And we do still collect that, but we're, we're much more focused on thinking about what helps us tell the wider story of Chicago. And so I think that's where, uh, and, and in no small part, you know, Archie Motley, as Ellen mentioned, we, we very much try to look at the people that make up Chicago, um, not necessarily people who hold those traditional positions of power, but who are leaders in their communities in different ways, or participants in their communities in different ways, and, and represent the full spectrum of, of things that are happening in this city, not just someone who, you know, is the head of this corporation or, or this particular, you know, office, that we try to look for, for some of those broader stories, because that, that really does actually reflect the history of Chicago in a much a much more um, in-depth and accurate way. Has that in any way, I mean it, it's interesting, it also mirrors the, the move in historical writing to writing, mm -hmm. you know, social and cultural history uh, that was, you know, started by the New Left in the 60s and 70s and has mm -hmm. really become ascendant and it seems to be challenged increasingly now, I think, in the aftermath of the Great Recession. There's I think a move back to writing about elites mm -hmm. <laughs> and the powerful uh, increasingly. But I'm, I'm curious to know if um, Archie Motley um, moves your collecting away from political figures, um, you know, because obviously we're particularly interested in city government records and city government figures. Uh, was that in any way backburnered by this broader move to? you know, social activists and this kind of wild, wider world, or was it just a more inclusive look? I would say that it's a more inclusive look. Uh -huh. um, and I would also probably add that maybe one of the modern collecting challenges that we face is that people who do hold positions of some kind of prominence or public prominence, the, the biggest thing that can sometimes negatively affect our ability to collect those papers are that people are much more aware of that sense of legacy and how will people view me and once I give my papers to a public research facility I no longer control the story that's being told about me. People are free to look at this information and draw their own conclusions and I may or may not like or agree with what those conclusions are and so that's probably been maybe one of the bigger shifts that every once in a while does um, make it complicated to, to figure out whether or not we're able to give certain papers a home. And I, I don't think that's unique to us. I think that's probably a, a pretty widespread uh, uh, issue that, that people are just much more aware of their public image, not just now, but how it will outlast them. That's interesting, yeah. Have you lost collections over that or um, that fear? Not that, not to my knowledge, but I think it comes up in terms of when we talk to people who are interested in donating or who are, are sort of beginning to think about that. Um, some of the questions that they ask, you can tell that it's on their minds, and um, I, I think that that's something that that does always happen. I, I don't know that whenever you look at an archival collection, you also always know that you're only ever getting a piece of the historical's pie, so to speak, because it's impossible for any one person or place to save every single record they've ever touched or created. Right. And so I think that people are sometimes more, you know, more interested in whether or not they can be selective about what, what stays public versus, versus what stays private. In thinking about whether or not we have any sort of <coughs> level, uh, implications for our collections, I would have to say no. Um, Part of it has to do, I think, with our with our mission. That you know, as a public research facility, one of the things we do focus on is we we want to go out and, and make things accessible to people to use and to do research with. So we're not so much interested in in things that you know is the secret. Is it not secret? Is it? Um, that's one of the things we actually usually address with people right up front. Is making sure that that we ha are getting a collection that people understand what it means to donate, 
uh, materials. And also, although we certainly respect and balance some privacy issues, you know, certainly in the case of, of you know, there's certainly information that's protected. You don't want records with someone's social security number or certain very, you know, information that's that's legitimately not appropriate for people to see, especially while people are still alive. You know, that the, there are things we have that we have to be mindful of um, for, for legal and other reasons. But I think for us, we really take the view and, and other archival repositories too is that we're in the business of, pro of providing information to people in an upfront way. So. Um, I think a different kind of institution maybe would, would deal with that more, <coughs> but um, with us, it, it's just more of a, we tend to look at it more as in we're getting things that are, are to be shared uh, with other people and we're in the position of making it possible and making it accessible for people to use those. So um, not so much of a, a reveal of, of secret secret things. So I, I haven't had a, a, a big issue with that. Um, I know as part of a larger conversation for archival research, I know one of the things that is being talked about, although we haven't dealt with it much here, would be social media feeds. And I know that there is sort of a, a discussion amongst librarians and archivists about how can you tell what, when is information truly meant to be public versus something that was sort of harvested off of someone's um, you know, private computer or something like that. Is a Twitter feed public? Can you actually harvest someone's tweets and make this part of an archival record somewhere? Or was that, that something that is in sort of this gray area that's, that's actually, it is public, but it's not something that you as a historian or archivist can go and just sort of harvest at will without getting extra transparency and permissions involved with that. So I suspect eventually we will have to, to deal with some of those questions. I'm going to start just because we get a lot of this in the research center, and um, my colleague pointed out to me that these are these are government documents, and these are used a lot. These are the building permits on microfilm, and we have 1872 to 1954, and we a whole variety of people use these. Um, people who are architects looking to to do something with a property. Um, people who are investigating their history of their home, people who are trying to prove that their two flat used to be a single family. <laughs> so, but these are very popular and they come in two stages. There's an index and you start by your address and everyone says, but my address used to be, well, it's under, if you know what your address used to be, that's great, but you're always gonna look under your current address on this sing small reel of microphone, which leads you to a date and the date takes you to a ledger. And so I've got the ledger here starting with 1872 and the ledger that finishes with 1954. And so these are heavily, heavily used. Um, so we get a lot of people here in the research center who never imagined they'd be using microfilm again, but, but they will be. So those, those we like to point out because um, they're just a wealth of information, um, depending, also depending on the era. Uh, people who are looking for the architect of their home, the architect wasn't listed until 1912 and later. So city recording practices just changed over time. And the thing about the very early ones, um, everything was basically handwritten. So when you pull up one of these microfilms with the ledger, you are trying to read that cursive writing and trying to say, you know, so the owner of this home, I can't make out that name. <laughs> Can you read this cursive? So we're always, it's always a joint effort for people who are using the set of microfilm. I'll move it off to the side, but these are very popular. <laughs> you mentioned the, uh, the architect. Of the yes. What are some other questions that would motivate people into those archives, what do they want to know? Um, a lot of people, I think we get a couple classes of people here, which are not necessarily government document people, but in terms of um, the self-historians, the house history people, and the family history people. And the house history people just want to know every single bit about their house. Um, you know, and then the people who are engaged with talking to the city about maybe a water bill, those are the people who say, well, no, this is, has always been a two flat. So they wanted, that's what they want to find out in the building permit. It wasn't a single family. There were always two water entrances, that, that kind of thing. So it's, it's often people who are just curious about their home or people who, who, who need to prove something to the city. <laughs> I don't mean to put it like that, but that's, that's often what that comes down to is people really trying to, to figure out everything they need to know about their home. It's going to say, um, 
the type of home, is it a flat, is it a dwelling, is it a store, is it a factory, um, the proposed structure of the home, is it brick, is it wood, um, the amount that you paid for the permit, um, if, before the architect was put, the contractor was usually put as well. So if, if that was of interest to you, sometimes the contractor was the owner. So there's, there's often, I think people are fascinated by that as well. Um, in terms of collections that are popular and collections that are underutilized, I would have to say that our archival collections in general tend to be very popular just because I think there's something very compelling for people about looking at this unpublished material in the sense of, of discovery that you, you get from it where you are getting to do your own interpretation of information. Um, there are definitely sort of trends and fads, if you will, of, of depending on what people's research topics are about which collections are the most requested. I think that in terms of the government collections, ones that tend to be perennially popular are um, the uh, Ogden Papers, uh, Chicago's first mayor. Um, Leon Dupre, who was um, an alderman for the Hyde Park area in the 50s, who was very active in social justice issues, um, that collection is quite large, so that also makes it very useful for researchers where there's quite a bit to, to go through and to draw from on a variety of issues. And then we do actually have a set of papers uh, uh, related to Harold Washington's mayoral campaign, which I've pulled up a few boxes of here, and I think that's very interesting for people to look at too because it tells the story not just of um, someone once they're in office and what they did there, but how they got there in the first place since his, um, his electoral um, path was, was a, a challenging one and, and said a lot about the city and said a lot of, of, about larger issues in the city um, as well. Um, I think in terms of underutilized material, um, probably some of the lesser known uh, committees and initiatives that were often sponsored at the mayoral level um, mayors like to do sort of special committees on this and special initiatives on that and because there isn't really a good list of those published somewhere you may not know something exists even to look for it so one of the really interesting ones that i've come across lately was that um, under harold washington there was a, a mayor's advisory commission on latino affairs records um, which was examining um, a wide variety of issues of interest to the uh, latino american population in chicago um, again tells us a lot about what was going on in the city at the time. Um, and it's also interesting because it's a bilingual collection. There's quite a bit of Spanish language material in there too. But it's not necessarily someone something that someone would think to go look up in our catalog because it's not a regular standing government office. I'd also add too that I think some of our photographic collections, while not being government collections specifically, tie in really nicely to the building permits. Um, people may be familiar with some of our Hedrick Blessing photos or Chicago Daily News photos, which really get some great representations of Chicago neighborhoods over time, which can provide a lot of visual evidence for changes that have taken place in the city or what things really were like for, for people in terms of living conditions, what buildings looked like, um, what people were living in which neighborhoods, what they were doing, where they were working, and you can really see that in a way that you might not be able to see in, in textual information. But people are often more comfortable with text, so they tend to sort of bypass the photographs. Is there <coughs> Do you have any recommendations on how people would look for those special committees? I mean, I think the trick seems to be that you just don't know that they exist. <laughs> um, is there some kind of um, strategy you would recommend when you're going to the catalog to try and, I mean, would you use the word special committee, or is there some, some way to, to sort of suss those out? It is a little bit of, of an art, and I think that's where um, doing a little, uh, being willing to cast your net quite widely at first helps. Sometimes when you start searching, people tend to either go with a very specific term when they start or a very general term, and this is where starting with a very general concept um, will really help you. Um, what I found really helps is going broad, broadly enough that you're, you're actually just starting with city government or mayor and seeing what pops up and, and you will actually be quite surprised and then because those are usually mentioned in the description somewhere it will start popping up all of those I would say that that's where I've actually myself had quite a bit of luck turning up some of these 
Um, committee is also an excellent word to look for. They're almost always a committee or a commission. Mm -hmm. So there is a little bit of that understanding some of the conventions of government and how they tend to, to name things when they create them that will help you come up with the list. But it is a little bit of, a, of a, an exploratory mission when you do that searching. And you have to be willing to sort of dive in and, and, and read some of the descriptions of the collections to see if they're, they're of interest. I'll add to that that one of the things when you are searching the catalog, one of the things that helps is that you can go broad by a search but then drill down to the type of material. So you can do a search and then say, okay, I want only archival material mm -hmm. and or I want only published material. I want, only want photographs. So at least it gives you that sort of mm -hmm. sense of like this is what's covered in the photographic collection. This is what's covered in the archival collection under these topics. I think some of the published material on city government is underutilized, and I think it's because of, I, it, it's, it just seems kind of dry. I, it, it's, you know, I um, was browsing for um, the Chicago Fire Department reports, and I came across the Chicago City Manual, which I will confess I had not run up against, and I brought a couple copies out here because I think they are hysterical. Um, so. This was put out by the Chicago City Statistician, who is also the city librarian. So yay, librarians. Um, but I think it's, you know, the Chicago City Manual is a very sort of generic name. So why, you know, why would you pick it up? Um, it wasn't published continuously. And that's the thing. Some of these were published and dropped. The city council proceedings, you know, were published continuously, but they went through a variety of name changes, too. So you kind of have to deal with that kind of thing. So the Chicago City Manual, um, I brought 1909 um, when the street numbering changed to see if they addressed that, and then the year after 1910. Um, one of them has an index and one of them doesn't. So if you don't have an index or a table of contents, yeah, it's going to be frustrating to use and you have to sort of leaf through it. But um, in terms of the things they discussed, let's mark some pages. Um, they were very, you know, you think, okay, Chicago City Manual, it has to be very dry and you know let's talk very basically about this very factual well you know I went straight to this pie chart that's labeled unfair apportionment of unfair apportionment of revenue well I love that it's right there in the title it's unfair that's what they say and the library only got 0.9 percent just saying that so you know but that's they it's just not not it, it has a point of view. It has an editorial point of view here. What year is that from? This is the 1910. Okay. And um, in terms of Julie and I were talking about some things never change. And I don't know if I can show another page. Great. Um, I think it's the 1909. Let's see. Bear with me. Um, maybe it is the 1910. Where uh, this is the... Uh, Busey, Busey. We are. We're always wondering to each other. How do you pronounce that name? Um, in terms of who is the mayor, and oh, sorry, everyone. Thought I marked it, but uh, there's. I think there's an opening here where he talks about. Um, no, it's the 1909. Pardon me. I'm sure you can. <laughs> I was so good at marking things. I have more, more pictures. Okay, yes. Fred A. Buse or Busey, who, who knows how he pronounced it. But this is the financial soundness of the city of Chicago. And this is 1909. Um, and he says, in the first place, there is absolutely no excuse for the careless, if not malicious, speaking and writing which have a tendency to spread and broadcast the impression that the city of Chicago is bankrupt or nearly so. Nothing could be further from the truth. Well, and, and here we are again. So, <laughs> 1909. <laughs> so, I will mark you now, Fred Busey. And, and his picture, so you can see what he looks like. But so the mayors of Chicago are, are facing the same problems from 1909 to 2016. <laughs> Loose talk of bankruptcy seems to be the issue. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's a headline in a couple of days. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So. But but who, you know, again, it's a it's an unrevealing cover, it's an unrevealing title. Who would know that all you really have to be willing to dig? And one of the things 
in terms of the way that we are structured as opposed to an OpenStax collection is that when you come to the research center, you have to look something up in the catalog, you have to fill out a call slip, and then we retrieve it for you. So it's not OpenStax browsing where you can just be saying, oh, this looks interesting, and I pull it off the shelf. So there is the sense of having to work a little harder or have a librarian say to you, hey, I think this would be a great resource. In terms of the use that could have, I could imagine a lot of use for this. It has a number of things in it. One of the things that it has is salaries. Um, not the page I marked, sorry. Uh, but it's, so you've got salaries of um, aldermen and um, personnel, I think, uh, you, we, we are even listed here um, when we were at 638 Dearborn. Um, but there's one of the things, too, for a snapshot of that year. So um, I'm not sure when it, we've re recently started to get questions um, regarding History Fair, Chicago Metro History Fair, which has joined the Chicago History Museum. Um, one of the things that is a popular topic is the race riots of 1919. So people were saying, well, what else was happening in 1919? If there is, and I can't remember, sorry, if there is a Chicago City Manual for 1919, you can use that to place 1919 in context of what's happening in the city. So I think both, you know, historians and younger scholars um, would find these useful. Picking a favorite uh, document or collection uh, within our materials is always a little difficult. Uh, um, it's kind of like asking a parent to pick a favorite child, I think, sometimes. Um, so this this was a really interesting one to, to, to pick. Um, one of my favorites is actually currently on display, so um, which has to do with a logbook for uh, stolen horses. Uh, um, it's uh, from the uh, early 1900s, so it is something that I think is sort of a fun look again on the theme of some things never change. Uh, your mode of transportation may uh, be different now, but the, some problems are, are as old as populated uh, civilizations. But some of my two favorites, I think, that currently that I found um, and I'm really enjoying um, there's this very early uh, real estate assessment rule, essentially a tax ledger, which again doesn't sound that exciting on the surface, but I think that there's something um, very interesting at looking about how Chicago in some of its early days was really, um, again, dealing with, with an issue that is sort of always ongoing and up for a lot of debate, um, complaining, positivity, other, other speculations. This is just something that for as long as that there has been a city and as long as there has been people um, uh, doing doing some some shared financing of the city and its services, there's a there's a lot of discussion of what gets taxed, who gets taxed, how much is it taxed, um, under what circumstances. And so there's something very very interesting and very powerful to look at how we were keeping records um, from earlier eras. Um, and because this is a long line, I'll just kind of turn that around so you can sort of see some of this. So to clarify, these are special assessment rules? Um, no, this is essentially standard real estate okay. taxes. Oh, um, like property year. taxes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but, um, you know, some very simple record keeping. Um, and also we can probably all look at that and be like, wow, that seems so inexpensive uh, by compared to compared to Dave's standards. Um, but I think it's really, what's really interesting here is that you can just sort of see how, um, how they were tracking um, what was being done, who was paying what, on, on what schedule, and, and how much things have changed or, or have not changed. And so there's something really fun about uh, taking a look at this, as again, we have something that exists that really is the modern interpretation of this today, but you can sort of trace its origins all the way back to the early days of the city um, and see what's, what's what changed. What year is that? Uh, this one, I believe, is 1840. Let me just check. Um, 1848. So, so there you go. Um, the other thing is uh, a little bit more of a, um, a more contemporary thing that's close to my heart. Um, we have um, 
some records related to the Chicago Housing Authority um, and their development process. And one of the really interesting things about this collection is the time period that it represents. Um, there's a great deal of material from the 50s and 60s and sort of the early days of, of urban planning and housing as we, as we know it today. And it's a really interesting representation of how decisions got made um, what people's thought process was in terms of how housing in Chicago was handled and what they envisioned um, a, a certain outcomes for, for, for these kinds of development that you know we live with today. Um, some decisions that we think, oh, that was smart, and others that we may think, oh boy, that I wish they hadn't done that. But it provides so much context for how and why some of these decisions were made and how, in general, these kinds of processes work at a government level, that it's not somebody who came down and waved a magic government decision wand and said, OK, there is going to be a building here, but not here. That, um, as with many things, there's a, a lot of people, a lot of different viewpoints involved, a lot of negotiation, um, issues of money, that, that, that really is sort of a process that involves a lot of different people and a lot of different viewpoints to arrive at whatever was done or not done. And, and these documents really show that. So for someone who's willing to sort of spend the time to go through these, um, just the discussion is really fascinating and, and tells you a lot about, about the time and about the people and about some of the way the city has been shaped um, in what we live with today. I think the fire department material that we have is fascinating. Um, this is the Chicago Fire Department Port of the Fire Marshal. This is 1879 to 1881. And um, they do interesting things like they show the number of fires during the past year and why they happened. So we've got things like um, the cause was explosion of gas, a thawing water pipe, or uh, carelessness or malicious mischief. And these are things that we get, people are in Chicago are rightly so very interested in researching the fire department. So we get a lot of questions about, you know, is there a comprehensive list? And um, you've got the patience to go through this. Yes, there is. Um, the nice thing too is one of the names that's kind of bandied about here is Dennis Sweeney, who was the famous fire chief. And looking at these, there's a little paste in where it is compliments of DJ Sweeney. So this came from him. So in terms of provenance, we got this from Dennis Sweeney. So is that for every year? Do you have those lists of fires and causes? And that and you know, and that depends how they're on their recording practices. Um, Definitely for 1879 to 1881, and I think beyond. But um, I would I would have to check to see if they were consistent throughout their recording practices because it it, cha it, cha it changes. I mean that's that's the thing. Just like it, how building permits didn't record the architect at first, and then they did. There's not the thing about you know especially a city as old as Chicago. Not everything was recorded exactly the same way year after year. Um, and one of the things that we get is, I feel like we get less detail. As, <coughs> excuse me. I feel like we get less detail as we go forward. In terms of injuries of um, firemen, oh, here's also a page of salaries. But yes, and it's it's really the injuries of the firemen rather than um, the people in the fire. Um, so April 28, Nicholas Dubach, captain, captain of engine number 16, was severely injured while responding to an alarm of fire on sliding pole at company's quarters. Um, May 12, Lauren Schnitz, pipeman of engine number 27, was severely injured by being thrown from horse with exercising. So yes, there's. <laughs> so the, yeah, this is, and again, I don't know that the detail is, is as great as you go forward in time, I think. You know, especially, this is 1879, 1881, Chicago was smaller then. It's, you know, it's, I always see that when we're going through the building permits and you think, okay, there are going to be so many for this year. Well, no, if you're earlier in Chicago, it was not as populous. There are fewer building permits than there were when you get to later years. In terms of um, questions we've received that, that are very interesting use of government documents, that's 
It's a little challenging to answer because we don't always know what people are doing with the results of the material we help them find. But um, in, we did have a very interesting email question um, recently that one of my staff members answered asking if um, after the Chicago fire, the fire is just a theme for me today, if cows were banned from city limits. And he did use the city council proceedings to discover that just, it wasn't cows, it was stray animals were, were banned because of the hazard that they provided, but cows were not singled out to be banned from city limits. But those, but that's, there's a lot of lore about Chicago, so I think, you know, things like that. Um, there are, we get questions um, regarding, uh, this is not a city document, but but questions regarding prohibition, people are always interested, was there a record kept of the speakeasies that, they, that were in Chicago? Well, no, because people who are operating illegal speakeasies did not want you to know, so there is no record of speakeasies. <laughs> but I think people are, people are interested in that kind of sort of very Chicago information um, that they can determine. In terms of innovative uses of the materials, I am that is one of the things that I wish that we often did know more of what people do because we what we do tend to see are the things that get formally published in the form of books or sometimes scholarly articles, but not always. Those are there's such a wide range of ways in which people can make their their work available, um, and I know I think that I, I strongly suspect that people use our collections for for more creative projects, um, both that are multimedia or more artistic in nature, and I wish that we saw more of the results of those. Um, um, most recently, um, as part of a fellowship program through the Black Metropolis Research Consortium, we had someone in who is a scholarly researcher who is pursuing graduate studies in theater, who was looking at the history of um, African American education and particularly education of women in Chicago. And her, she's her project is yet to be finished, but I know that part of it was going to incorporate sort of a, a, a stage performance of some kind. So I'm really excited to see that when it comes out because to me that seems like a very unusual use of our materials. We're um, a little less dry, a little more transformative in nature. Um, I think the other thing that I'm interested to see is that I've heard more talk from people about taking advantage of the mass amounts of data that come from these types of documents and exploring sort of the digital humanity sides of, of things in research where what can you learn when you look at not just one set of papers but many sets of papers? Um, are there ways of, of doing some kind of uh, computational analysis of language or other aspects to it and what can you learn from that? Um, and so I think, I think I'm excited to see some of the projects that will start coming out over the next several years because that is really sort of an innovative way of, of working with these materials. In terms of who visits the research center, we have a wide variety of users. Um, and that includes, you know, students of all ages, uh, 6 through 12 for history fair, undergrads and graduate students, faculty members, and we definitely see journalists. We have had Curious City here a number of times. Um, one of their reporters, uh, they often work in, in conjunction with the Chicago Architecture Foundation. So uh, in two different stories, one was a story on bungalows, um, where they came here and did a lot of research. And then the other was the story about the 1909 um, city numbering change. We have the scrapbooks of Edward Brennan, who's proposed the change. And so it's, and, there, and we've got ephemera on um, the change where there were neat little postcards that you could send to a friend that said, I still live in the same house, but this is the number now that were just very cool and connected with that time period. Um, we see architects a lot. The closure of all the Chicago schools had a lot of architects coming in and asking for architectural drawings of those buildings so we can tell, you know, what's up next for development. Um, those are not city documents, but still, well, they are in a way, I guess. So yeah, we see a lot of architects. Um, we have a lot of international visitors. Um, we just had um, a Jap Japanese documentary company coming in and uh, doing um, a documentary on the Chicago fire and they're going to come back and do another one on Al Capone. <laughs> so, these again, we talk about Chicago lore, the things that Chicago is associated with. Right. No Michael Jordan? <laughs> <laughs> I, it's, we, we have a great deal. We have, in terms of what's going on in October 2016, we have a great deal of ephemera on the Chicago Cubs. Um, we have the Black Sox papers. 
Um, we are less well represented in terms of basketball and football, I'd say. Um, we have images of the, um, the Negro League football teams, but it's, we're not really up on the Bears, the Hawks, so, but baseball. <laughs> In terms of the new additions, these are um, acquired for us through anyone who's used our resources. So um, either unofficially, um, in terms of quoting from an archival book, authors usually say, "Hey, I, you know, you were so helpful," and they send us a copy of um, their book. If they've gotten any of our material um, reprinted from our rights and reproductions department, they are contractually bound to send us a copy of their book. So it's the, the new editions over here are all things that have used our material, which is wonderful. Um, uh, we are currently um, negotiating um, with a couple authors who are working on the Chicago Red Squad files. Um, this is a collection that was uh, given to the museum. The museum was deemed the um, neutral party to receive the material that the Chicago Police Department collected on suspected subversives, um, primarily in the 50s and 60s. And this collection comes with a lot of restrictions. And so one of my colleagues is, is sort of our de facto expert in working with the authors as they work to um, write their you know, dissertations or their books or articles. Because if you are going to, there's a court order that governs the use of the Red Squad material. And if you're going to name anyone's name, you have to get that person's permission. If they are deceased, you have to get their heir's permission. So it's a very, when Julie was talking about restricted material, this is a collection that comes with a lot of restrictions imposed by a court order. So one of our occupations in the Research Center is working with these um, historians, authors, graduate students writing dissertations who want, who want to talk about the Red Squad and, and letting them know that all the permissions that they need to get and then send to us so that we know um, that the subjects are, have given their permission to disclose their names. Are there any other notable uh, academic works that come to mind in recent years or uh, ongoing that have made use of uh, city government documents or documents related to government office holders held here? I think that's a great example of one. For example, uh, looking at those texts, um, do any of them, uh, to your knowledge, uh, have any of them drawn specifically on the collection of city government documents here, or would it be more on, on the collection generally? I imagine that Amanda Seligman in Chicago's Block Clubs has used. Um, Julie and I are fairly recent to the museum, and my colleague Leslie has worked the most with Amanda, but she's got two publications, and I'm blanking on the name of the first. I think it might be Chicago Block by Block and now Chicago Block Clubs. But I believe that she has used city papers in her research. She's up at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee, I believe. So, she, you know, like, uh, I think she's done Lawndale and things like that. So. So community papers and city papers to talk about um, segregation and demographics in the city. Yeah, I was just thinking about that. I know that um, nothing that's out yet, but I know that there's quite a few people in that are very interested in the history of the police department here and the history of policing in Chicago. And so I think over the next several years, I know that there are a number of projects that people are working on, both book and uh, documentary film, that will probably come out. So I think those are the ones that I'm a little more familiar with, just because they've been worked on or initiated since, since I've been at the museum. But um, it's been really interesting to see which collections they're working with, and they are using uh, a wide variety of city documents related to that, as well as neighborhood documents. Um, I was going to say, I don't actually have names for the projects because they're not released yet, but um, it's something to keep an eye out for. So um, one of the things I do is I coordinate a seminar at the Newberry on the history of capitalism, and we recently had Nancy Blanger come and give a paper based about the Chancery Courts in Chicago. And I know she used to work here probably before you both did, um, but one of the things she was doing is she's writing this history as um, what she describes as a graphic history, kind of taking mm -hmm. on the mo model of a graphic novel, but uh, using, using a lot of images in writing history, and she's thinking about how it might fit on a tablet and to like kind of think about how the picture and the text can be braided together. 
Um, and it's based a lot on archival materials here. I'm wondering if you've encountered anything like that. Any uh, Are people writing graphic histories? Is that something that you've heard about? Or is this issue just uh, kind of on the cutting edge here? I've heard about it being done, not necessarily with our materials. I, I hope people are. I wish they would. That would be amazing. Okay. Um, I think there would be a lot of uh, great subjects, but I'm not currently aware of anyone that we've worked with that's pursuing that kind of a project. In terms of, um, of visiting the research center and using our material, um, our catalog is available online, so we have a number of people who search in advance of a visit and email us. Um, and, a and a number of people who just show up, and either one is fine. Um, we are different, though, from you know an OpenStax library like the Harold Washington Library in that to use the research center, you do need to register at the visitor services desk downstairs. Um, they have you fill out a form, so they've got you on file, and then they'll send you up here, and we'll check you in. We sign in everyone, and so we keep stats on who's visited us. And um, we talked to our researchers about their, it's not a browsable, as I mentioned, it's not a really browsable collection. There's the material that's out here in the research center that's used often enough that it needs to be right here. But um, there are always two reference librarians on duty at the reference desk because it really requires some, uh, some walking through the procedures. And so um, you found something in the catalog or we've helped you find something in the catalog and then you're gonna fill out a call slip for it. And so call slips are um, by color. And this is just a good visual for us, for our staff members who retrieve. So if you're retrieving something um, from the archival collections, it's a pink call slip. If you're retrieving published material, it's a blue call slip. And we were talking about those, those underappreciated photographic materials. It's a white call slip. So, so this is, you know, you're hopeful that your, what you found in the catalog represents what you want. You've filled out a call slip. You've told us where you're sitting. Julie and I are sitting at numbered seats. That's how our staff members find you. And you turn in the call slip and we have a staff member who runs and gets things for you. Um, things are dispersed throughout this building. So um, when you come to the research center, we do like to know if you came at three o'clock, we would let you know that we stop retrieving material at 3.30 just because, you know, the way things are scattered throughout, by the time if we've retrieved something at four, you're not going to have a lot of time to look at it. So we have to sort of have a cutoff point. Um, so there's not a lot of self-service here. It's a lot of um, librarian um, guidance and intervention. And uh, let's see, for History Fair, um, we do a booming business for History Fair students. And we have a whole protocol with them where we require them to make an appointment. There's a website on our there's a form on our website, excuse me, and because we can only take so many per day. Um, and so they give us their topic. And with History Fair, we usually have a bibliography that we've done in advance. So when we know their topic, we pull up the bi bibliography. We pull up any reference materials that are already here, any ready print files, which are the self-service photo files, any clipping files. And so when the students come, we can hand them something to get them started. Because in January and February, for example, we're often telling our other researchers, if you could come on a weekday, Saturdays in January and February are very busy with History Fair students. And when we open at 10 on Saturdays, they're lined outside out the door. <laughs> so we have sort of have an assembly line of we check them in, they tell us their name and their topic, and we've got a whole stack of material to hand them to just to sort of get them going and start them off. Um, and often the, the very dedicated ones will get into the archival collections that Julie manages. We, um, we did, Ogden was a popular topic last year, and we had, we had a student looking at Ogden's archival material. We have had students doing the Red Squad, <laughs> which requires a lot of discussion with them about privacy. <laughs> but, um, but bottom line is it's, it's coming to research in the research center is not just like walking into a public library. So um, people do have to be patient with us. We have people lock up their bags. We are pencils only. We are no food and drink, so, and often we're the first time that somebody's experienced a special collections facility. So they they often look at us, maybe like we're crazy, but these are just the protocols that we need to follow. In terms of special considerations for how we handle the archival collections, we actually don't 
um, require gloves for using archival materials. Um, when you wear gloves, you tend to lose some of the dexterity needed to be gentle when you handle and turn pages and handle paper. So we actually prefer no gloves so that we there's less risk of accidentally bending something. Um, but clean hands, of course. Um, one of the we, we do tend to let the condition of the materials dictate what kind of restrictions might be in place. So we do sometimes bring out book supports for things that are bound but might be somewhat delicate. If something's truly fragile, where it, it's, it's very brittle or just crumbling away, that's where we do start to look at other things that we can do to still make it usable by patrons, where we might enclose it in some kind of a mylar sleeve, or in some cases, we might even actually make digitized versions available and encourage people to use those um, facsimile versions rather than the original. Um, because they will be able to engage with it a little more directly than they can with something that they have to be so so gentle with. Um, in many cases, too, um, that digitized version can be easier to work with just from a visibility standpoint. Um, earlier, when we looked at the old tax ledger, you can sort of see the darkening paper, fading ink, old tiny handwriting. These are all things that can be really difficult and time consuming to deal with as a researcher. So sometimes a facsimile is, is a little bit easier to work with, especially if someone is new to working with archival materials. Um, I would also say that in the catalog, um, where, some, where we have determined that something is too fragile, we usually have a note in the online catalog that says, fragile original use microfilm instead. Um, so we have a microfilm surrogate that will serve um, in its place. That's, that's happened with newspapers, that's happened with um, some other collections as well, but I would say that we're not actively producing microfilm anymore, but those are instances where, where we did because the, the original was too fragile. I would probably add to that all of that adds into my other sort of tip for people working with archival materials is that even someone who's a seasoned researcher, if you are used to working more with traditional published material, you have a certain sense of your, your reading speed and your speed at which you can work with and process that information. And one of the biggest learning curve issues for, for people who engage on ar with archival research and these kinds of things is that it just takes longer because of some of the handling issues involved. It takes a little more time to absorb the information. Things can be more difficult to look at and read is to really allow yourself some of that time to engage with the material. And as well, in some cases, you're dealing with very large collections. Um, uh, the, the Red Squad files that we talked about earlier, there, there are literally hundreds of boxes, so it's going to take you some time to look through some of that depending on, on what, your, your, what your goal is. So coming in and, and, and being cognizant of the fact that it's going to be a lot longer than looking at something in a typical reference book or a traditional published book is, is a really important factor. In terms of reproductions of documents, like, like many things that here, it, our policy has evolved over time. So um, I have a staff member who is here prior to our camera use policy, but when I came, we had a camera use policy, which is fantastic. So we do photocopies here, and we have a staff member who does them, because it's not, again, as Julie mentioned, in terms of using these materials, it's not like slapping them on a photocopier. It has to be done with care. We have a book copier for, our, you know, the binding can't be smashed, that kind of thing. Um, but we have a camera use policy that allows taking photographs of any of our material, and uh, except for the Red Squad. Um, and we have researchers def who definitely come in. They come in with their limited amount of time, they've requested the material, and they're literally just standing, click, flip a page, click, flip a page. And they're getting all of that to come home. Sometimes we see them again. We had somebody the other day who said, I was here a while ago, I looked at my digital reproductions, they weren't as good as I needed them to be, so I have to come back and shoot them again. But that's a great time saver for researchers, is having a camera use policy. And that's almost all repositories, as far as I know, are doing that now. So mm -hmm. that's, we appreciate that. Like so many things in the Research Center, um, there's a little paperwork. We have a form that we require people to fill out because it's for research use only. Um, if you're going to reproduce it in a book, that's a conversation with the Rights and Reproductions Department. But, um, but a camera use policy is a great time saver for researchers. One of the challenges which Julie has alluded to in terms of using the collections is time. Um, uh, all, all of this material, whether it's managed by Julie, archival, managed by her colleague Dana, photographic or managed by us, published, is served through the Research Center, um, which has a, a small staff, so as a consequence, limited hours. 
So we're open Tuesday through Friday, 1 to 4.30. In the academic year, we're open Saturday, 10 to 4.30. So a researcher who comes in like at 3.25, even though they might have made it before the cutoff of retrieving things, is not going to have a lot of time to absorb this material. Um, so that's one of the challenges, is that working within the time frame that the research center is open, which, which we know can be a barrier to use. And, um, the other thing is, I think Julie might have already alluded to this too, is these very large collections. And uh, they have been collected over a variety, of, over a number of years, and some of them have very different processing levels. So you could have a collection that doesn't have an incredibly detailed finding aid. So you were, it's going to take some time. You know, we've got had researchers where it's a large collection and they, they request a number of boxes because they, they open a box and they know very quickly um, whether they want it or not, so they have to, you know, and it's not, so they need to request another box. So it's, it's you know, again, it's the level of detail you're going to find or not find, um, and it's the time frame that we allow. We, I know we had an in email inquiry from somebody about a collection, and it was a collection I'd never heard of, which happens because we have an enormous amount of archival material, um, and it was a 30-something box collection, which I feel is substantial, um, that didn't have a finding aid. So and I'm sorry I'm blanking on that name, and, and I think that also drives use as well. If it's hard to use, it might get overlooked. Um, and it really, it comes down to, again, the number of years that we've been here as an institution, the changes in priority, the number of staff. Julie is one person, her counterpart in prints and photographs and architectural material is one person, so we, they have to determine the priorities of processing. I, th I think also, too, it's one of those factors that, again, speaks to the, the unique nature of archival research, because even if, no matter how detailed your inventory or index is to the collection, it, when, especially when you're dealing with unpublished materials, they're very difficult to describe, um, to provide both content and context for, for, for people's research purposes, because they were never written with that purpose in mind. Um, somebody's diary or somebody's journal letters or there's so much of this where it's going to cover a wide variety of topics. Um, some things will be evident but not explicitly mentioned if you look in terms of things of what kind of a you know social life it might represent or different aspects of the community you know they're not necessarily going to appear as a keyword in that letter but but it would still be evident when reading it so a lot of that is, is probably going to be almost impossible to capture comprehensively in any kind of a, an inventory and so that's one of those the bigger it is um, the, the more material there is to go through and the more um, there's information in any kind of index but it's never going to represent the full the full wealth of information you might be able to draw from it and that just really um, I think is one of the other you know difficult things where giving yourself some time to sort of luxuriate and, and also that a lot of times these collections mean more in aggregate than they do with one particular document here one particular document there you may choose a quote or a page to represent the overall meaning that you're getting from it, but you really don't get a sense of that until you've had a chance to look through a bigger portion of it. And I, I don't know if I have a good example of an official city government record record or collection that would provide an example of that, but a, a recent um, government adjacent collection that we have had a lot of interest in is the African American Police League records. Um, they were a, a sort of union-like organization um, sort of within the police department that, that was, was formed by African-American police officers who were concerned about police community relations and also the recruitment and retention of diverse um, members of the police force. Um, so there is a lot of government-related documentation in there because they were tracking everything from salary and promotion rates to incidents of police brutality, but I think it's close to 300 boxes and pulling out an individual a membership roster or something like that is not necessarily going to give you the full meaning of, of that collection or some of the issues that that might represent. But if you have the time to look at, say, 10 boxes or 20 boxes or sort of identify that section, um, you'll get a lot more out of it. And so when we do the inventories, we do tend to try to provide a window into some of the things we think might be the most interesting or useful to people, but there's still a lot of, there's always going to be some burden on the person doing the research to kind of make their own meaning from that because what we have identified well research interests change over time um, and these are all sort of unusual things to look at at times
In terms of, of people using our city government collections and using other collections, I think one of the examples, and Julie has alluded to this when she talked about Leanne Dupre, the alderman of the Hyde, in Hyde Park, we've had, we get a lot of email, and so a, a couple years ago we had some researchers, I think they were from Wisconsin, email, and, and there were a couple, and she was doing one thing and he was doing another, but he was doing Dupre, and because of Dupre's interest in civil rights, he said he wanted like the Catholic Interracial Council papers pulled as well. Um, or Friendship House or one of those. So they're always, so they're looking for the, the, the issue that is in tandem with that government official's interest. So um, I know people who have done Ogden have done the railroads um, because of Ogden and the railroads. So there's, it's, they're always sort of looking and I think that one of the great things about um, the robustness of the catalog and the subject headings there is that, you know, it's not just, you know, these are the papers of William B. Ogden, you know, these are all the subjects affiliated with him, so you can link, click on one of those subject headings and get to other collections that talk about those things as well. One tool that people hopefully are familiar with, but if not, is certainly useful, is um, the Explore Chicago Collections portal that covers um, all of these, in, you know, most of these institutions that you're mentioning where we, and um, you know, the Chicago Public Library and um, other institutions around town have pooled catalog records there so that people are able to sort of search across repositories. So for example, if you are doing your um, paper on the planning for the 1992 World's Fair that wasn't, you can find out what we have, but maybe what else might be at UIC or Chicago Public Library or other institutions because there are definitely um, events or offices like that that are big enough that we're, each of us might have a, a little bit of a piece of the puzzle um, where there's not necessarily one definitive repository for it. Um, IRAD um, at Northeastern is certainly a very popular choice um, for government documents. Um, the clerk of court reference desk, um, the recorder of deeds. Um, one of the other things that I think people aren't always aware of is that the city government itself has record keepers and people who make records accessible and that you can also sort of go straight to the source, so to speak, for some of those things. Um, and we definitely send people there. Um, but with, with archival collections, I think we frequently see people visiting two or three places at least um, to see what holdings they might have or, or finding that we have related holdings or related collections. So with the city uh, record holders, you said the clerk of court, um, what other city offices have records that you refer people to? Um, a recorder of deeds would be the other, uh, okay. I think, mm -hmm. big one that I would I would mention that is worth going there for. Um, a lot of the regional and local government does uh, records do end up in IRAD, so that is still probably one of the sort of single best best points of reference. Um, what else? Some people too. Um, but I mean, I think you know, with um, permitting and architectural issues mm -hmm. too, um, the offices that deal, you know, that issue those permits also are, are places that you can go to pull pull information um, that would tie into some of what we have here and, and sort of be the, the most recent versions of some of those permits and plans and, and development plans. In terms of um, going back to the building permits, these are something that, so the 1872-1954, we have a microfilm copy and UIC Daily Library has a microfilm copy. But anything built after that is a FOIA request to the city. Mm -hmm. So people are always, you know, if you've got, if you're unfortunate enough to have a house built after 1954, you have to go to the city. In, in terms of people going to us and going to other places for government, I'm not seeing it as much as I am with things like um, both world's fairs, mm -hmm. for example. Um, we have material in Century of Progress, but UIC has the official archives. Um, I think, yeah, I, th I think the way I might break it down mm -hmm. is that it's more common with events mm -hmm. rather than people, okay. and that has to do with how the records get donated, where when a, an individual or their family d donates their papers, they tend to give the whole thing to one institution. And while there might be a little tiny pocket here or there, um, the meaningful amount of whatever they've created in their lives is probably going to be at one institution. And so it's more common for events which involve more people and more entities and, and more parts of the city to have stuff that's ended up at a variety of institutions. Okay. 
Um, and so I think that's that's also tends to be how we try to help people figure out where to go. A lot a lot of figuring out what who might have what you need is thinking about who made these things and what path, what, what organizations are they affiliated with, because that tends to sort of give you the, the through line of what university or public research institution or city government office might have those, um, because things tend to sort of follow a connected path from the point of creation to the point of turning into an archival collection. I'm curious, do you have any, maybe you don't know this, do you have any sense of the future of your acquisitions of city government documents? And like, are you going to be, are you just kind of in a position of waiting for uh, donations, or are you going to be kind of an active collector of, you know, obviously there's always new city government documents being created. Um, you know, many of them I would imagine are increasingly digitized or something, but do you have kind of a, a collection plan for city government documents or you know, a strategy that you're pursuing or is it just kind of a matter of just seeing what people offer? Um, well, you're asking that question in an interesting time because as an institution, we're in the middle of developing our collection plan for the next however many years, so um, if you were to ask me again at a different time, I might have a, a slightly different answer uh, to that question. But I think in general, um, the consensus is that we are still interested in collecting them, but we're interested in being, um, I was trying to think of how I would describe it, uh, of being very um, selective in what we choose to collect. Um, one of the biggest evolutions in archival repositories, and I think especially in historical societies, is that the old model, especially for historical societies, was to take every single thing you could get your hands on, no matter how big or how small or how um, meaningful or not meaningful or useful or not useful it was, and there was a lot of focus on amounts of things. We have this much stuff, our collection is so big, and really placing a lot of value on this sort of completest, biggest set of stuff. And I think the way of thinking um, in, in the current era is that, that that's maybe not the most useful or responsible way to collect to really preserve information that, that is helpful, that is accurate, that is good in a representative way, um, that makes it um, reasonable for people to to engage with and work with your collection. So I think we will probably continue to look at identifying and being very selective and looking at our role as being sort of identifiers and selectors of what collections are really going to help get at some of these meaningful pieces of information. Again, I, use, I think I used the example earlier, it's maybe not every elder person's papers, but trying to find you know, perhaps the elder people who are most active or who are representing neighborhoods you know, at significant points of transition or change um, that are, are really kind of telling those bigger picture stories um, that we can focus on. So I think we will probably kind of pursue that kind of path in the future. Um, in terms of making a determination of what we um, identify to add to the collection or what to acquire, um, it is something that does fall on a, a, a group of people. There's a lot of people and a lot of steps in the process um, of doing that. Um, the people who are the collection managers, um, like myself, are involved. The curatorial staff, who are the people who are responsible for sort of creating exhibits and events and other things that interpret that information. Um, um, we have a, a, a group called the Collections Committee that involves representatives from those and some of the other departments at the museum, um, including um, the Research and Access Desk uh, Department, because um, Ellen and, and her staff represent um, the area that's most in touch with what people are looking for in terms of research and research trends and what's useful and not useful. So we have a, um, a fairly large group of people that get together to review things that have been identified as possible collections to be added to the museum. And in addition to looking at, you know, is this, is this a good collection, there's sort of a much more detailed assessment 
um, of the, the quality of information that's represented. Does it tell a new story? Does it tell a complete story? Does it continue with new angles of a story that we've already started to tell here in some way? Do we already have things represented pretty well in this collection? So this would really be one more melted teacup from the Chicago fire, which we already have a bunch of, so it's not really giving, a, giving anything that's going to add to people's ability to understand or interpret those events. And as well, we look at condition and format and our ability to preserve and care for that, that item, because if we can't be responsible stewards for that particular thing, it's not very responsible for us to take that on. And unfortunately, sometimes there are materials um, we've certainly seen things where a bunch of paper left in somebody's damp basement for years and years and years is basically a giant mold bomb. And sometimes you, it's so far gone physically that it's not only unusable by people, but there's really no way to get it back into a useful condition. And if we were to bring it in with our collections, what would end up happening is that everything else would become moldy too, and we would actually end up probably destroying things rather than adding to the collection. So there's kind of a whole involved process of thinking through these factors about both the intellectual addition and then the, the physical necessities of, of the collection that we that we look at to make sure that we are being responsible. Um, and then as well with our, our mission statement and some of the collecting policies and guidelines that we do have in place right now, we do really heavily look at how it does help us add to, continue, um, or, or do other things that help us really represent um, the full story of Chicago so that we're not, again, duplicating things that we already have in the collection. Um, <coughs> I was trying to think, but um, yeah, so, and, and the best way to do that is by getting input and buy in from a lot of different areas who represent the wide variety of people who use the collections and the wide way in which we use the collections here in the museum. Um, we know that we have both internal and external audiences, so we want to make sure that we don't prioritize one over the other, and, and that's where the, the wisdom of a larger group is, is very helpful. Um, and then, of course, as well, um, as an organization, um, we regularly interact with members of the community and our patrons, and you know, we certainly take you know, feedback and information that we get from them to heart. So not so much in selecting specific collections, but when people um, have information for us about interesting things that are starting to happen in Chicago, or you know, their positive or negative experiences with what is or isn't represented, it's something else that we, you know, we pay attention to and we, we think about. That specifically that we're spearheading ourselves, um, I think, or I think one of the projects that I mentioned um, that that we're working on in partnership um, are looking at photographic images and tying them into geographic place. So um, most recently there's been um, some tours around town that focus on the Eastland disaster um, where we use materials from our collection to visualize things out um, walking around town but to actually see what things would have looked like at the time and use historical images from our collection. So that, that one, although it doesn't use government documents, I think is a good example of the kinds of museum created projects that you might see more of in the future. We're, we're sort of in the infancy of exploring it ourselves. Um, in terms of collections that I think are right for use, um, gosh, I think almost all of them, really. <laughs> um, uh, I, I, I'm not sure if I could identify just one that I think this is what people should start with. I think it would really come down to what topic people were most interested in, but certainly I think with some of the, the sort of social service related organizations would be, would, would be right for something like that, or some of the larger collections. Um, I think size would probably be one of the things I would think would make something really ripe for that because of it, it's information that you would truly benefit from being looked at um, in that way that you're going to get something out of it that you can't by just physically looking at each document in each box yourself. Well, we're often asked here in the research center, you know, is this available online? Why mm -hmm. hasn't this been made online? And 
and you know our our response is that you know it takes time and it takes money, mm -hmm. um, and I I don't know that any repository is really has either of those. So so it is it is a challenge. So we, you know things like the Eastland Chicago Zero Zero app I think was done with grant money. Mm -hmm. um, Julie is working on another project um, that's in conjunction with another organization. So it's always it's always anything that we do in terms of digital is always going to be either looking for outside funding or a partnership. Um, it just it's there's not a lot of grassroots we can do just on our own. We're always going to need to partner with someone.